Here we go. Oh my goodness. I've just watched this guy's movie made in Australia. David Macmillan escaped from a Thai prison. That's just one of his stories among many. So I'd like to thank you for coming here today, David. I enjoyed a trip to Guildford. And, uh, <laughs> I haven't been down here since I visited a, a friend who was actually locked up somewhere from here. Oh, it's beautiful around here, isn't it, with the countryside yeah. and the river, the cathedral, the castle, everything. It is good. He was one of those guys that, um, really good guy, solid as a rock. Yeah. You know, wouldn't say a word, uh, you know, that he shouldn't. But complete hopeless case. Oh, Sean, man. if you sent him down the road for cigarettes, yeah. there'd be three police cars back in a minute. Oh. You know? So what do you do with those kind of orphans? <laughs> well, looking at your story, um, I think you learned to avoid those people quite well. Or when they did get you in trouble, you figured ways around it. And watching this movie, I'd see you get in a situation and have you thinking, this guy is so intelligent. What is he going to come up with next? I just knew you were going to figure something out and outsmart everybody. Like when the when the, the guy's coming to drop the drugs off to you, you don't abandon the mission because the police are following the guy. You think, all right, well, I'll pick them up right in front of the police, but we're going to do this in a certain location and the police are not going to catch us. Well, that was, um, I had a little heads up on that one yeah. because I'd been under investigation for a couple of years. Uh, and... I knew they had a lot of money and a lot of uh, resources. So, as you say, uh, there were the goods there. Uh, are you going to happily abandon half a million? Well, let's explain what the goods were, where they were coming from, what was going on at this okay. point in your life. Um, I'd retired. I'd got to 23 and, you know, it seemed like a good <laughs> age to hang up the spurs. And this is in Australia. Yes. Yeah. I was born here, but uh, moved to Australia as a child. Uh, and a friend of mine came to me with a problem. <laughs> now, uh, often problems can seem intriguing. I'm sure this has happened to you where somebody's <laughs> had such an interesting problem. You, you think, well, I shouldn't really get involved. And his was this. Uh, a Thai businessman uh, that was bringing um, cutlery boxes from Thailand with her heroin pressed into it uh, was in a hotel room in the city. Uh, he knew that the police were aware of him and were waiting to grab at the moment of the big swap. Um, and he was inclined to leave town, as any sensible person would. But after we haggled a bit over what uh, humble recompense I would get for uh, taking an interest, <laughs> I kind of took a, you know, when he young and he actually takes stands on things. I thought, well, no, why should they you know, spoil everybody's fun there? So, um, but mostly it was trying to figure out a solution to it. So uh, I had to find a place where the police radios wouldn't function. Uh, and we had scanners in those days. They don't work now, people should know, because uh, they're uh, encrypted signals on, on the police channels. But uh, it was great back then in uh, 1980, this was. So uh, then I planted a couple of cars around uh, in the area, um, gave instructions to the, uh, for the meeting time. Now, Sean, you know that as soon as this guy grabs the, the stuff, leaves the hotel, he's going to be followed. So what do you do? I would have, I would have abandoned the mission. Uh, I would not have been doing what you're doing, but yes, I didn't. But probably <laughs> some. The risk was so sense. high. I was like, I'd be like, whoa. Yeah, but I, there was another thing because I'd been under investigation for a couple of years, and Michael, who'd been my business partner, he was as well. Do you think they'd ever let us get away, even if we'd run away from it? No. They'd go and arrest him with the goods, and that time-honoured. Uh, technique in courts, the conspiracy, as you say, honored since, uh, what, Guy Fawkes, wasn't it? <laughs> if you can't get them in the act, get them in the thought. <laughs> um, so they would have arrested us anyway. So yeah. uh, something had to be done. So if you can get rid of the evidence, that's at least helping the case. Uh, yeah, it, it did. Uh, we met at a, um, the casualty section of a hospital 
Um, so you organised the drug deal to go down in the casualty section of a hospital. Well, it would have been, it was busy. And this is radio blockage as well, this area. Except for us. Our radios, yeah. which were, um, they had crystals cut for a frequency between the regular ones. Right. So the scanners wouldn't pick them up. Okay. And, and I'd, I'd got those in the morning. Uh, we could communicate, but they couldn't. Um, yeah. Their transmitter um, went over a lake in a park that soaked up all their little rays. So... Uh, but it didn't stop them from trying. Um, when Tommy, who was the Thai guy, when he uh, arrived there, hi, David, good day. <laughs> this is the guy who's come from Thailand, Thailand. now. This is what, the uncle's nephew? Yes, that's right. Okay. Uncle is the one of the, the big guy. big bigs in yeah. the, the Golden Triangle. Um, yeah, he uh, was pretty much oblivious to uh, anything going on behind him. He'd traveled the world. He was delivering these things uh, all over the place. And an added wrinkle to this was that the police had been in his room the night before, drilled the box, knew what was in it, sealed it up again, not wanting to interfere with it. So were absolutely sure they had their, their, uh, their man and their target. They'd even booked interview rooms all around town for the many suspects that were going to be <laughs> rounded up. Well, um... You know, it's easy to sound good about this because it worked out. It would have been me telling you a very sad story <laughs> otherwise. Um, but he took some convincing that uh, there was trouble. I said, Tommy, um, look at the flower seller. Okay, have you ever seen a big, burly bricklayer selling flowers <laughs> with a fling of his left hand? No, it's usually a young girl. And see the man in uh, maternity waiting? He's talking to his knee. I, I know dads get stressed, but his knee is actually a microphone that's not working on, on this day. Uh, so when I got the signal that Michael, had, he, he drove in backwards through the uh, emergency uh, entrance where the ambulances go, uh, I grabbed Tommy, uh, led him to the thing. He threw the... Uh, uh, the dingus, we'll call it, uh, into the into the front seat of Michael's car. He tore away. I grabbed Tommy, abandoned mine, went over a back fence and got into other cars and drove off. I got up on a big hotel roof later on to try and get Michael on the radio. I think it was static from Tierra del Fuego or somewhere in the world he disappeared to. So that, that was another uh, disaster avoided, but they didn't take kindly to, to missing that one. So, wasn't there a second one, or am I confabulating these, where Clell had a pram? Uh, no, that that was for something else. When they made the movie, okay. they didn't want to miss out on um, <sighs> things that were visually kind of interesting. That was used in uh, an escape thing. So the movie yeah. just put that in there, did they? Yes, they okay. can right. Because it's... I suppose it's hard to film it dramatically uh, when it's mostly uh, radio checks and signals. Yeah. You've got to have a lot of, uh, I suppose, telling close-ups of, of what's going on. Yeah. So it uh, must have been one of those directors who said, no action in that script, you know, use that other bit from somewhere <laughs> else. But uh, in essence, it, it was all true enough. Yeah. Uh, for... Um, a three million dollar um, television movie. It wasn't as bad as all that, was it? Was one of the stars of Neighbours in it, or did it just guy just look like one of those? Guys? Um, Toby Schmitz was. He played uh, the awful Macmillan. Okay. On some of the reviews the next day, he said, "Look, I, I can't see why you're glorifying these you know, heroin dealers." Yeah. And as my judge said, <clears throat> you know, "Merchant of misery, you know, uh, yeah. peddler of death." Um, but, um, it, I mean, even some of my friends who were kind of sympathetic to the days when we started out uh, doing weed from a grocery store, uh, later on they'd sort of say to me, yeah, David, but heroin, is there any good side to this? You know? And, you know, looking back on it, I have to say no, really, because putting aside the, uh, the risks and the dangers, um, at over 60 now, I can say if you can do something with your life 
you should probably try and follow the, um, what is it, the physician's uh, mantra, do no harm. Don't, don't, don't harm, do no harm, yeah. Um, yeah. And if you haven't got any choice, then fine. If, uh, if you and I are stuck in the middle of Afghanistan and, you know, We've only got a fat companion to eat. Well, we do what we have to. So another scene from around this time is you're building up this crew. You've got your girlfriend, Clell, we'll get to that. But you've got this other guy that you help out with a situation. And this situation really gripped me. And again, just the way you handled it masterfully. So you're showing up at this guy's house just as... There are two guys with balaclavas over their heads. I've got them at gunpoint, and they're and they're take, they're about to rob him. So you intervene, and I'll let I'll let you tell the story. Well, um, it was kind of just a, a bit of a routine event. It wasn't anything special. Um, <laughs> that clearly had said, "Look, I, I want you to meet some people. They're really interesting." This is Michael. He used to be a, a Commonwealth champion pole vaulter. Did his knee in, went out of that went into the dope business. His wife's Colombian. My ears kind of pricked up at that. <laughs> um, and you know, she knows everybody. Well, they all do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the very first meeting, uh, I arrive and there's those kind of telltale signs, the, the, the door ajar, um, a few splinters here and there. Uh, so I went back to the car and and got a gun. Now I should say about guns that uh, I've never found them any use whatsoever, except for a prop. Uh, because uh, if you shoot somebody, uh, two things will happen. You'll become a murderer. Um, because what do you can say about a gun? I didn't know it was loaded. Or um, you'll just make them angry. Uh, in fact, I left a, a restaurant once and um, some friends had uh, robbed a huge gun warehouse and we all had, we were like Billy the Kid, we all were playing with these things. Uh, and I went back to get some documents from the car uh, and there were five guys kicking the living shit out of some poor slum in a gutter. So, huh, intervene here. Uh, I took the gun out, screwed a big fat silence on it. I mean, that's got to be terrifying, hasn't it? Um, and went over and waved it in their general direction. I said something sympathetic. Uh, I think he's had enough. And you know what happened then? The little guy in the gutter leapt to his feet and told me, to fuck off, mate, this is none of your business. <laughs> so obviously they were friends and that was just their way of, you know, getting close to each other. But um, I, I'd learned from that that mostly they do no good. So when I Is went that an Australian the, thing? People have a tough attitude towards guns out there. Oh, it wasn't <clears> that. He was, uh, they were a little gang and they were had, having some dispute and they didn't want, I I think they were probably too glue sniffed out or, or whatever to yeah. quite recognize what was going on. Okay. Um, but when, when I was at Michael's place, the other thing that uh, as I stood at the doorway, I heard the voices and I knew one of them. Uh, Lou. One of the robbers? Yeah. He was, uh, Lou was one of those jail identities that one comes across. It, uh, he and his little mate um, would pretend to be you know, big and hard, but the little mate always had to tear him away at the last minute from the real fight. <laughs> Lou, Lou, no, no, we can't have that again. You know, remember last time. Nice and nasty routine. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, he, the kind of social mechanics of it fell to pieces when I walked in because uh, he recognized me and I spoke to him like uh, I'd met him down the corner shop. Uh, so let's just set the scene a bit here. So these two guys, balaclavas on the heads, I've got your prospective friend yeah. at gunpoint and you now walk in through the door with a gun holding them at gunpoint. Is that what happened? Yes, uh, I waited uh, to pick my moment until uh, the shotgun had been uh, lowered, um, and then to raise it would have been caught. On, and where was on, the shotgun the then? Table. The big guy was holding it on. Yeah, a yeah. sportsman. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and why did you wait until he lowered the shotgun? Because I knew if he'd want to swing it around, he'd hit the coffee table, <laughs> uh, and he'd, he would have lost the moment. So I, I had it pointing at him. Uh, 
And but I went straight into a normal conversation. That's sort of disarming in its okay. own way, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, don't mind the gun, Lou. Uh, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> Take that sock off your face, too. <laughs> oh, hi, Dave. That was the other one. Yeah. What did Lou? What was his response? Well, um, he had to gather his composure and then almost immediately started making excuses. Like, uh, Oh, but th th these guys don't share. And I've heard that before. From, what does that mean? Uh, well, um, I guess it means uh, that uh, if you've got a business, you go looking for losers to give your money to because that would be sharing. It's just something people say when uh, they don't know what to say next. <laughs> so uh, because he was already in the process of, uh, and quite a few of these home invaders do it, buddying up to the, the people they're robbing. Saying, well, if you haven't got all the money tonight, I can come back tomorrow night and all that kind of thing. I, I, I don't know uh, why they do that, but um, uh, I, I think they're used to just robbing their friends, so they probably want to make friends first and then steal from them. But uh, Michael turned out to be uh, an interesting uh, and very loyal friend. So uh, the robbers just depart then? Yeah, I, I said, Lou, you, you'll, you'll have to go. You know, uh, I've I've got to see this man about some things, and you don't want to get in between all of that. Okay, so in it's probably the people watching is probably thinking that they're missing something here. In mm. the in the underworld, in the crime world, there are hierarchies, and there are local big bosses that are respected by the, the lower people, and they're aware that big bosses can have things done to anyone within that community so the fact that you walked in there and these two armed robbers just left like that within the structure of the underworld these guys must have known you were perhaps at a higher place than them they they would have known a couple of things that um some the way i kept myself safe i, I went in in the beginning with a, a bunch of hippies um <clears throat> into the weed business and then met some safe crackers who are into the A-class drugs. But as uh, I went on and started importing and making a lot of money, uh, I realized that uh, I'd have to protect myself. And the best way to do that was by proxy. In other words, people knew that if something happened to me, the big income for a lot of these very frank businessmen, if I can call it that, yes. um, would not uh, the income would be interrupted, so uh, they wouldn't uh, want that at all. Um, <clears throat> it's <clears throat> for somebody to interfere with anything I was doing means they'd have to uh, kind of completely go off the reservation. Whatever they did, they'd then be on the run uh, and. Um, I wouldn't have to do anything. Uh, business associates would be doing it. But mostly prevention is, is best. You know, one of the most useful things is people have a fear of the unknown. If, imagine London villains, uh, like stick insects, they fight with each other because that's their, their closest competitor. You know, they don't recognize a rhinoceros. But uh, something unknown is fearful. Uh, if because I traveled the world and had friends from other countries, uh, they might think where's they could outfight or bluff their way through uh, a local villain turning on them. If three Mexicans turned up with nothing but Polaroid photographs to go on and kept killing everybody that bore a resemblance to the photograph, um, then that would be scary. So. Uh, I actually got the idea from um, uh, a big, pretty much a gangster. I suppose he was. He was. He was. Uh, he did armed robberies, big drug deals. He had this Lebanese guy at his side, lithe, nimble, you know, a little overdressed. Uh, I wouldn't say he cleaned his fingernails with a knife, but he, he knew he had one somewhere on him, <laughs> um, and. There'd be signals exchanged with this guy. No, oh, no, steady there. No, don't kill this one. All of that. Um, but 
his name was Denny, the, the gangster. Uh, I said, Denny, I could have sworn I've seen this guy somewhere before. Oh, well, you know, uh, I met him in, uh, uh, in Lebanon and, you know, I say, oh, no, no, not that speech. He's a waiter in a restaurant in Sydney, isn't he? You know, don't tell anyone. What he'd done was he sort of dressed him up and he looked the part um, kind of so dangerous that um, giving the cover story that it helped out the family and, you know, <clears throat> he, this kid was forever grateful and kill anybody on site. It was perfect. Um, of course, because your, your real... Um, your real killer shouldn't be somebody who looks the part. It should be the old bag lady across the road who, you know, pulls off the latex and then does the business. Yeah, the Cali cartel, they had some hitmen who just looked like your average uncle with, um, you know, with glasses and a very sympathetic face. And and um, no one would suspect, you know, these guys were coming after you. They, they just, mm. you, wouldn't, they, you wouldn't even notice them when they were, were walking past you on the street. Did you and ever then, meet uh, anybody in your various jail transfers that uh, had a reputation for uh, doing contracts? Yes. Yes, I did meet people. Is yes. there anything about their nature that struck you? Yes. I met some people in the New Mexican Mafia before prison, and they were they did have a lethal energy about them. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they did look the part a bit. They did look the part a bit. Two Tonys was a mafia guy I met, and he did have a aggressive uh, kind of lethal energy about him as well. So the ones I met were more overt, yes, compared to what we've just been describing. The more undercover ones, I imagine, would be more successful in the long run. Or, or I suppose, uh, we within jail survival, um, the overt ones would make that clear. To their advantage. Oh Whereas yes, the ones one of who were one. Uh, quiet uh, would see no advantage in in letting people know that. When I was in Tutoni cell one time, the skinny little guy comes in, and he's read one of my books that I've given Tutonis, and he's asking me if um, he can buy this book off me. And I say, no, you can have it. You know, I get a lot of books sent, and I'm do not donating to the library and stuff. And he was a Mexican American guy, and and after he left the cell. To Tony said, you've made friends with a good one now because he was like, I really appreciate you giving me the book. Are you sure you just want to give it me? And I was like, yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's good book karma to give it you. I'm getting all these books sent in. And he pulls out a, a bandage and he put it around his fist and he goes, look, I've got your back. If anything starts, I've got your back. And then, and then he left. And to Tony's was like, you, you've, you've met a good, you've made a good friend there. Mm. Him and his homies was in a cell one time. They were all high and, and drink, drunk on hooch. And a guard found them. And, um, he, he stabbed the guards to death and he was tortured and put in, um, he lost like an organ. The guards tortured him for years and all this stuff. But he was like, yeah, he's this old school killer, stone cold killer. Mm. But, but to look at him when I gave him the book, I was, you know, he just looked like a polite, skinny, harmless person. Um, yeah. Well, <clears throat> sounds like it'd be ideal for his calling. But I noticed <laughs> he did believe in skincare as well because he had the cloth around his. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that shows somebody's got enough experience to know, damn, that scar lasted a long time. I've got to do that again, you know. It's got his priorities there. Uh, the, um, when you mentioned Hooch there, uh, I was in Wandsworth only a couple of years ago, and uh, the, the Polish guys have distilleries in there. Yeah. They sell it for about £40 <laughs> for a litre. Quite clear. No bready taste. Yeah. Then um, I get nicked with it every so often. You were in Wandsworth a couple of years ago visiting? Yeah. No. No, this is what happened. After <laughs> you were actually in prison a couple of years ago? Twenty. After 25 years, the Thai government um, served me with an extradition notice. Oh, my goodness. For the old case. It came about because I'd been out of things for a decade. Yeah. Um, everything was quiet living peacefully in Kent, more or less. Uh, and then some, now, I, I never feared extradition to Thailand because of the death penalty. Mm. Uh, the, the British government wouldn't <clears throat> do it. Um, however, um, his name escapes me, but um, some half-wit 
uh, killed a U.S. Marine in Pattaya or Phuket, Phuket, I think, in Thailand. Now, <clears throat> he came back to the U.K. Uh, as you know, uh, the Americans don't really like you messing with their citizens and certainly killing one of their <clears throat> ex-Marines uh, without doing something about it. So that hundred years of refusals to Thailand for extradition was overturned with this one okay. guy. Lee so they Sam. came after you. And they thought, well, we've got a victory here. Anybody else we don't like. So after all that time, uh, some police turned up to see me and said, they had that look about them that you're coming with us. And, uh, and there I was. And once was, was where they held the extradition cases. Um, it wasn't looking good in the beginning yeah. because the <clears throat> Thai government was giving lots of guarantees about um, <clears throat> that I wouldn't be executed, that I would yeah. be on possibly on death row for the rest of my life, which wouldn't be too long on death row. It's very hard to live on death row in Thailand, expensive. Uh, Alex, the uh, Italian mafia go guy I knew on death row all those years ago, 20 years ago, he, it was costing him about 10 pounds just to get a shower every day, which wow. in local terms is, is quite high money. Well, we're going we're gonna to get to your Thai death row stories, but let's just jump back in time now to keep this chronological. Right. So you've bailed this uncle's nephew out of this situation now. The drugs have been taken from the police, had this guy completely surrounded and surveyed, but you've outsmarted the police. You've created enemies now in the police force because of what you've done. You've made a fool of them. Now, what? how does your relationship now develop with the nephew of the uncle? Well, <clears throat> of course, I, I said to Michael uh, after that. Michael's um, the guy that you bailed out the robbery? Yes. The sportsman. And he, um, he worked with me and he was a courier. Uh, for about uh, two years. So he owes you now and he's, you've saved his ass and he's a loyal worker now. Well, I, the couriers were more than workers. Um, I, I worried about them. I fretted over them like children. I couldn't, you know, clearly used to say, look, let them do the work. I've got to be nearby. I don't want them making choices if something's different than uh, is planned out. You know, he had multiple... <clears throat> passports uh, and he was pretty good at it he he was tall uh, taller people are less frequently stopped you've probably noticed that at airports um, and so he was fine but he kind of wanted to go out on his own even though I was paying quite generously for his work and um, I did ask him look <laughs> What's behind all this? I have to know. Well, he explained who uh, Tommy was, that he was bringing the stuff from Thailand. I said, Michael, how did this come into your lap? Well, I, I bought him from somebody. What was that? Well, somebody was doing business with him here and, and said, I don't want to do business with him any longer. And if you give me 50000 he's all yours. He'll deliver door to door oh. for a quarter of the regular wholesale price. Oh. I said, Michael, ah, he's a terribly nice fellow you met there. Didn't want that money anymore and thought you deserved it better and for a miserable 50 Gs, he's all yours. You go, oh, that was nice. By the way, uh, who, uh, who was this guy? This generous person. Oh, look, I, I swore I'd never give his name. Well, I know you wouldn't give his name but do I know him? <clears throat> okay, Michael, I'll save you the embarrassment. He didn't want you to give his name to me. He didn't want you coming. David, look, uh, oh yeah, he was, a, he was another Michael. Uh, Howard, anyway, we'll call him. Um, don't you think Howard would have had some reason to give you this guy? And of course, it turned out to be true. Howard had been uh, doing business with him. The Thai man leaves his house, police run in. Howard's trying to flush half a kilo down the toilet. He's nicked. He's in real trouble here. The only thing he can say to the police is, I can give you Macmillan Sullivan. Really? <laughs> and so that was the deal. 
so he uh, sells the, the the Thai national to uh, Michael. He starts doing business with him. It all goes tits up very quickly, and that that was how it was meant to be. So um, once I knew that, um, I realised uh, this was not going to stop. So uh, we had to. Um, try and stop him from coming back to Australia or anywhere else. But he, he took some convincing. And um, I suppose there's lots of things that could have done better, but um, he did come back, empty-handed as it were. He just came back to collect some money, but the police acted out of nervousness. They thought, this was a two-year task force operation. It was, it was quite uh, a lot of money spent on it. Now, you or I, I suppose anybody, if you're up to some mischief and then you find out that a million pounds has been spent following you around, are they going to go back to their boss and say, nothing to it, that Sean's clean as a whistle or we just can't get him on anything, so uh, what's next, huh? More trips to Europe, more, uh, uh, more fancy cars and special offices. <laughs> I mean, they've got their own department for all of this. No, no, the boss is going to say, Get out there and pinch them for something littering with, That's in, a result with intent to supply. <laughs> um, and, and and that's what happened. Um, the big arrest happened in the usual way. Doors kicked in in the morning. Funny thing, I had a German shepherd called uh, Sasha, and she would usually yap her head off if there was somebody at the door. I'd been up all night, nervous over something. I'd watched Scott of the Antarctica, fretting about him being in his tent. Only another 10 miles, I'm saying. You know, there's a can <laughs> full of supplies, but his feet were knackered. I mean, he got... Anyway, so I'm a bit sleepy. I hear the key go into the front door. It opens, it hits the chain. Then the beginning of sledgehammers. And... This was the difference. The sledgehammers were not the panicky banging away of uh, robbers or intruders because I was reaching for a gun and I thought, wait a minute, slowly, we've got all day. <laughs> Left the gun. I said, Tell, get ready for a long one. <laughs> so we're stashing little things around the place. We all got arrested. There were no drugs found. It was a messy case. It had to be a conspiracy. Um, all the couriers were contacted and said nothing. Um, the case, as good as these cases ever go, was looking all right um, in that sense. Um, all the people who worked for me didn't want to say anything. Um, the, it was not easy to get. People have trouble if they behave badly in the, in the business, as you know. If they run around town, you know, um, torturing people or robbing people's money. Come court day, there's a long line of people willing to testify against them. But it's not really a slight. It's not so easy to find people. Okay, let me just let me just halt you here then. I just want to give a bit more backstory to this at this point because um, you've got these main characters now. You've got Michael. Tommy is the guy bringing it in from Thailand. Mm. You've got Clelia, your girlfriend. Um, can you just describe how you met Clelia and what your relationship was like with her and what you guys were doing? And just describe a bit more about how you were making your money illegally before we go into the right. incarceration. Okay. Um, I'd met Clelia. Um, she was the daughter, one of four of a, a Italian, Australian, Melbourne restaurateur. He'd come from the northern Italy and had a big family place and lots of kids everywhere. Uh, they used to call him the Spaghetti Mafia, uh, all those early restaurateurs. She was the bit of a tearaway uh, amongst the group, uh, a bit of a tomboy, uh, but we were in love, we were very close. Uh, we could you know, rely on each other. My business, she was a bit nervous about. I would... Um, Using a lot of, um, lot of fake passports, um, I would make it look like the couriers had come from London when they arrived. The documentation would say that. They would pick up a bag that also looked like it had come from London. So Australian customs in those days, and pretty much still the same. When you go to the immigration, he assesses 
how much of a risk you are. He stamps your customs card and gives it a code letter. When you go to the, the gate with your bag, that letter will determine what check you get. So that if I've already assuaged his suspicions by having somebody that looks okay and appears to have come from a country that doesn't uh, export drugs usually, though I, I must say now that uh, for all you newbies out there, um, England does not have such a pristine uh, reputation anymore. Uh, it, it can be seen by Australia anyway as, as a potential source of pills and so on. Anyway, it wasn't in those days. So um, there would be couriers picking up in Thailand and they were in, it was packed in um, stereo boxes then. Uh, it would change hands a couple of times and as I say, arrive back on a quite innocent looking person whose documentation backed it up. That was important. I could get passports by the bucket load in those days. Then I had my friends who um, uh, sold it, um, not exactly wholesale. Um, they were trying to keep it clean so that it had a very good name for itself. Um, in fact, they had even street people who'd put it in little capsules so that you could recognize these capsules so that uh, you knew what it was. Um, the, also, uh, they, they knew that it wasn't um, uh, adulterated. So business was good for a couple of years. And was Michael one of your smugglers as well? Yes, he was. He was. Uh, he did kind of asked me to, uh, when he started making quite a lot of money, he did say, oh, I, I'd like to do my own thing. Welcome to it, Michael. Go for it. Got any contacts over there? Well, I, that's the thing, Dave. Uh, can I use your guy in Thailand? Sure, sure. And uh, how are you going to get it back? Well, I was going to use one of those stereo things that you use. Can you? Okay, anything else. Um, and selling it. You've had nothing but trouble. You know, uh, in fact, the guy who set you up for those uh, two robbers that night, he was your best friend. You recall that, don't you? The one man you could trust. <laughs> um, was he able to do anything through his wife being Colombian? And you said your ear pricked up when you heard oh, that. Oh, yeah, you, no. I, I, I went to Cartagena. With, we all went on holiday there. And uh, uh, they came to me and said, uh, <laughs> we like the cut of your jib, which means they know your home address. When you say they, oh, the Colombian people from over Cali in, Cartel or uh, it was um, Medellin, uh, Cartagena. But this was for weed. They okay. were going to have ships come over with anywhere in the world, twelve miles off the coast, um, by by the ton. Uh, money? No, don't worry. Just give us ten percent to cover the diesel fuel, and you know, pay us when you can. And so you're in business with the Colombian mafia as well. This yeah, point. this is a big deal to the viewers. <laughs> they, I mean, when when a Colombian from uh, one of those families over there says, "Sean, don't worry about the money. You pay us when you can." <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not going to be something where it's not, uh, Jose you wouldn't believe it. That money, Vegas, Wild Weekend, it's all gone. <laughs> it's not something you can say to them. You know? Yeah. Um, so. And what was your first meeting like with the senior Colombians? Uh, well, I had to, uh, it was one of those funny meetings you probably had yourself where your person in the middle has brought you to the table, has introduced you to sort of a, a friend or underling or deputy, and, and then through another couple of uh, voices, somebody who can actually make a decision walks into the room, and we were in a restaurant, and I looked at him and he looked at me and we looked sideways, which is the, this is the look. All these other people don't matter now. What city is this in? Uh, this is in Cartagena. Okay. But I, I, Are these Cali people? Um, I had some Cali people, but okay. um, that was a sort of um, kind of sidebar to it. That was a separate operation. Okay. They actually wanted, back in those days, they wanted China white heroin over there. I don't know quite what for. I don't think it ever went anywhere. Yeah. And really, for all the, the, the problems I've had in uh, Thailand and Afghanistan and, and Pakistan over the years, I'm kind of small beer. Okay, I've had some pretty big deals, but really in terms of uh, major players, I, I've never really been motivated that way. Um, and 
it's more like the challenge of doing it. That was what was attractive. When you're in these meetings, like the meeting with the, the guy you're talking about now in Cartagena, mm. do you fear for your life if this goes wrong? There's something I could be taken out to the No, I can't, I, can't, I can't see why. Um, a big crook once said to me, um, he said, David, you, you, I noticed something straight away. You've got no fear. I said, why should I? Uh, I'm doing good for you. You know, it's a good thing you've met me. I won't be squealing my head off in a police station somewhere. We all know that doesn't pay. <laughs> um, you make money. Uh, I'll have ideas that uh, I'll help your business. I, I can't, can't see. And they, they've kind of sensed that. So What did the know. Colombian, the big shot, what did he say then at this meeting when everyone went quiet? Um, just you and him. Well, um, when, when we got a chance to talk ourselves, he, he said that, um, uh, look, you, you can have it wherever you want it. We've got more than we know what to do. Kilos of cocaine. Yeah, oh, but we were talking about shiploads of weed then because that was weed. easier for me okay. to uh, move. The coke was um, uh, a bit of a, a bit tricky. Um, here's the thing with dealing with source countries. If you go to wherever it might be and, and you meet somebody, if you buy it then and there for uh, 2,000 pounds for a kilo, in Colombia, put it in your pocket and go back home, sell it for 35 straight. It's a good day. But if the guy who gave it to you is not some farmer, but a biggish businessman, they know to the penny what you're going to get for it here. Exactly how much. And even if you're running your operation, I've had people in different countries say to me, when I've had my own smuggling routes and things like that, uh, David, can you listen to that? Just throw a few of my kilos in there with yours. What well, sort of make room for it somehow? Yeah. And then what? What? Give it to your man over there. Yeah. Oh, if you like, you could sell it for me. Uh huh. And what it's you can see where it's going. You'd end up working for that person. All the stuff would be what. Oh, no, yours got lost, but mine still got through. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and that's thirty-one thousand five hundred, by the way, not thirty. Um, they, that's how easy it is to s slip into it there. But there's also the risk. I had operations in Mexico. You're going out there for the first time. If it's not a you know a, a, a hundred million pound deal or a ten million pound deal or something, if you, if it's lesser than that, then. Sometimes these smaller guys, compared to what the you know the the, the police and the the big mafia are doing, are working with the local police. Uh, They'll yeah. sell you the drugs. Yeah, you go down the road. Next thing, you're pulled over because mm -hmm. the guy who sold it to you is working with the police. Were you worried something like that might happen? Uh, I was aware of it. Yeah, um, particularly so in um, but in the early days in Thailand, and uh, I sold that. I guess by good fortune, I met somebody I knew. I'd never done anything apart from very minor deals and then kind of built him up so that he had good Chiang Mai connections. Uh, in Pakistan, they were uh, notorious for uh, setups there. Uh, we can get it through the checkpoint at the airport. That's uh, another 2,000. We can get it onto the plane. That's uh, 5,000. We have uh, our man who's going to see you through. Oh, he'll know who you are. Oh, will he? Uh, I'm half an hour late. Doesn't matter. He'll still know where you are. I mean, there is no man. You know, it's rainmaking. Um, if you, if you, if somebody gets arrested, oh, it was your fault. He twitched, or um, our man was late getting to work, and and then they want to. Almost everybody you meet. I mean, surely people from um, Mexico said to you that Sean, we'll be partners. We'll go fifty-fifty, and you'd be thinking, hmm. I seem to remember an old uh, Bugs Bunny cartoon where um, uh, <laughs> Daffy goes 50-50 with somebody uh, who he goes out and finds the gold, digs it up and takes it to the, <laughs> into the local town and they go 50-50. The other guy does nothing uh, and, it, and it's a bit the same there. Yeah, you, those you situations think... in Mexico, I met people, I just thought, this guy just wants to kill me and take my money. I've got to give him the impression I've, I've got be, nothing yeah, on me be, in this. Be, yeah, yeah, happy for that. Also, uh, did you bonus people? 
That is, when it gets through, then you get an extra cut. They got paid when it got through, my people. Oh, that's even yeah. better. Yeah. 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 So, but, so you paid not even for the raw material, as it were? Oh, you're on about bonus to the suppliers yeah. if it got yeah. through. Mm. No, the suppliers didn't know wh how we were getting it through. I kept it separate. But if you'd said to them they were getting a bonus, they wouldn't have been spending all those nights trying to find out how you got it through. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I didn't want to um, risk them knowing. Everything no, was compartmentalized no, no. to keep. Uh, that's yeah, ideal. Yeah. But in, in some places, in some countries, uh, even if you're going back to your supplier and saying, there you are, you've made five times what you'd normally make, yeah. um, they'd, um, they'd say, yeah, but. I don't sleep thinking about what you're making. <laughs> so um, they want to try and uh, you know, add some uh, bonus to it themselves. And, and I always found by adding that little bit extra on after everything went through, then they'd say, oh, that'll do. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have to pay the cops or anything like that. It's good to be generous to a point, yeah. I mean, paying policemen, well, I suppose there is that principle, you know, are you going to pay somebody for not doing his job? Imagine you're having a plasterer come in. Right, uh, don't plaster that wall, and I'll give you some extra if you don't plaster that wall. That's what you're paying policemen for. <laughs> I definitely won't do my job. Yeah, you can rely on me. I'm your man for not doing my job. <laughs> so you said about doing weed deals with the Colombians. Did that escalate into coke deals? Um, different people. Uh, what were they in Colombia? Yeah, yeah, in, in Cali. That was the Cali cartel then, was it? Um, somewhere, well, this is a situation as I understood it from, from working there. Um, all sorts of uh, beyond the country source sources, you know, everything from very small time growers to you know, kitchen up, laboratories. From Peru to, and Bolivia. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, going through, uh, yeah, going through Lima. And Tulcan, you know, that little airport. Um, Tulcan's a funny airport. They don't want anybody to get arrested there because they're so busy doing it in bulk down the <laughs> underneath. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't see that. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. So, some girl with some ridiculously high heels on, and she was dressed to the nines at Carly, snapping down the corridor, looking really good. And uh, I looked at those shoes and I thought, 750, 800 grams, you know, at a guess. Um, she got talking to me about something or other. I can't remember the content. Um, but I actually saw her on the flight back. Um, I said, well, oh, you didn't stay with your sister for two days. Uh, no, and she was completely dressed down then, you know, just looking like nothing. So, um, though, you know, sometimes you'll see things and, and you shouldn't kind of let on. Um, there was a, some hippie guy at Bangkok airport years ago. Uh, it was metal detectors to go through. He had a body packed. I could tell he was walking, you know, not quite right. Uh, sides of his trousers seemed to bunch up a bit. They, uh, the machine was malfunctioning. He was caught in a line uh, where they started to do pat downs. Mm -hmm. I thought, the poor bastard, this is going to be some time for him because it's 15 years for a joint over there. So I, I went over to him and um, said, uh, Jonesy, I didn't know what the hell his name was. Uh, the ticket office has got, given you the wrong boarding pass. Just go back and work it out there. Frozen absolutely paralyzed. Didn't know whether this was part of something. So I got a bit closer, I said, fuck off you idiot. Get out of the line, get into the other one. Um, and then he, he pretty much ran out of the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> sometimes you can either stand by and watch a disaster happen or interfere and get yourself in trouble, <laughs> which has happened to me quite in a few times. Um, so you've got the heroin coming out of Thailand, you got weed and coke coming out of Colombia. Are there any other countries you got stuff coming in out of that we need to know now before your arrest? We need to know, unfortunate yeah. expression. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, okay, there was um, 
Okay, to, uh, the money side of it. What do you do with money? So I take the money, go back to Europe, go to Antwerp, uh, buy diamonds, VVS twos, uh, F or G color, one carat, something easy to sell. Uh, take it pretty much anywhere where I can not lose too much money. The diamond business, as probably most people know, is a really tight little scene. Uh, the exchange is tight. Uh, the people who sell are De Beers still even you know, have this mystery that controls the, the value of it. So I know I'm going to lose money, but at, um, at least I can say if something goes bad, all right, you got me. I was smuggling diamonds. Is that a bad thing? No. <laughs> um, so uh, there was that, um, and 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 little silly things that um, you wouldn't think would be um, worth smuggling, like video recorder heads back in the day. Um, I suppose it was the equivalent of uh, uh, Swiss watch movements used to be a thing in England uh, about 50 years ago. Um, but really anything that was kind of interesting to do. Uh, what um, compartments and, because you're a bit of a crafter, did you make your own things? I always like to make, make my own what, stuff. What did you prefer to have people um, smuggle in? Something that would look um, solid, really. Uh, if it was made out of wood, fine. Okay, uh, the modern x-ray equipment will show up um, discrepancies. But most of the drugs we all like are organic anyway, uh, so they will show up in the same colors that wood will. Really? So unless it's uneven, okay. it's the unevenness that gives things away. Right. Or if it's pills, it's the little shape. Oh. Uh, I had a friend who was sending me some um, uh, Sabutex uh, by the mail, and he used to crush it all up so it was flat. So mm -hmm. if you wanted it back in tablets, which we didn't for various reasons, but mm -hmm. you just have to put them through the tablet machine again. Um, but no, it, it, it's even this that does that. And it, it was, uh, that was a part I liked, uh, doing a nice pack job on it so that the veneer went on and the glue line became invisible and the last buff of beeswax over it. <laughs> um, in fact, I suppose, um, if I, you know, through this deplorable career, um, the only virtue is that nobody who's worked for me has ever been a, uh, arrested um, as a result of uh, doing so. They've gone off on their own adventures and done so. During these early years, then, how many people did you have working for you? And that, what was your revenue? <clears throat> it was good. It was about uh, five million a year. Okay. Um, and, but a run like that only goes on for a couple of years. Yeah. If I just give you the most broadest outline, this teenage David trying a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, then there's the the Thai uh, courier system, mm -hmm. big money, don't know what to do with it, kick it around on top of a coffee table. Then, then decline and fall, mm -hmm. big arrest, uh, in terrible prisons for a decade. Mm -hmm. I get out of that. Uh, all the old police forces who enjoyed chasing me around in the old days are back for hoping I'll get up to some more mischief. And that kind of, it's no excuse, but that kind of drove me back towards doing it. Then I end up in Thailand again, trying to set something up, but get arrested uh, under the most unlikely circumstances imaginable. I mean, I took such precautions, Sean. Not only did I go to another city to get the passports, Michael was sitting in a, um, imagine the police are following you and they're intercepting your phones. You know that. They intercept a phone call between one of your friends to your mobile phone. He's, and you have this conversation. The, the masts say that that phone is in London. It's your voice on the other end, but you're not. Your friend has gone to a pay phone, rung your mobile that you've left him and played a tape recording of a conversation between you two. <laughs> So the forces of darkness have heard, heard this recording. So despite all of that, I get arrested. Um, 
I mean, my gray hair more or less happened overnight in that one in Thailand. It was so awful. Um, I found I was facing the death penalty there. I managed to get out just after, uh, with about two weeks to, to spare. I run around for another year, more or less okay, but the same kind of interested parties, um, the authorities, particularly people from the American DEA, I don't know what they've got to do with me, but uh, saw to it I get arrested in um, uh, Pakistan. Uh, I'm facing two sets of charges there. Uh, one is life sentence, one is a death penalty. I wasn't caught with any drugs, but uh, interesting trial system there. It's all in English from the days of the Raj. Um, they, I think I mentioned the other day, didn't I, that they don't accept uh, confessions because there always is one from the police. Um, they, so I don't know why they do it. They can't use the confessions in court. I think they enjoy themselves. <laughs> uh, and I'll say a bit more about how they get their confessions, uh, perhaps if we have time. Then um, I managed to get out of the thing in Pakistan. I go over to Afghanistan to tidy up some loose ends and get tangled up in somebody's kidnapping there and then and find my way back. Then think to hell with it, go straight back into business in a big way, uh, back into South America doing that, a New York contact uh, help there. Retired again with a load of money and thought, what does a London gentleman do? Uh, <laughs> he gets... He gets himself, he has a love affair. So I, I, I'm dating this girl who's uh, from one of those foundations that does echo green things. Knows nothing about me, not my real name. I've kept the David part, but that's about it. Um, this, in, in, in fact, in the, the new book, Unforgiving Destiny, I kind of go into the relationship with her quite a bit because there's this crazy thing where I'm, you know, she said, well, what do you do? For all I know, you could be a, a drug launderer or, or a money trafficker. I said, uh, Eloise, I think they do that the other way around. It's more useful. Um, and so courting her uh, at, at Blake's and the Portobello Hotel, and yet a week later, I'll be over in the badlands of Afghanistan, sort of swapping shots and drinks with some other bunch of people. Uh, so that all went bad there. Um, and finally, after some a little trouble in Denmark, then I've just had enough. It oh does wear God. you out. Uh, That's the grand overview. Yeah, yeah. Let me see what time it is. We've done an hour already, and we're only at your first arrest in Thailand. This is, I mean, if you're up for it, I think this is going to have to be a multi-podcast series. Well, how, how do you guys in, in YouTube land feel about this? Would you like to see see this in detail over multiple podcasts? Um, anyway, put put your feedback in the comments because my mind is just blown by this story. That that would also give me a chance to read more of your book and come up with more questions and get more detail out of your thing in the long run. But let's let's keep going for now. So it, chronologically, now you're you've just got arrested. Now you've been running this operation. So they've arrested you, Clell, Michael. Is Tommy in the mix here as well? Tommy's, Tommy's arrested. arrested. Yeah. He was vital to the look of the thing. Okay. And some hippie guy, Brendan, uh, from Scott's Head in New South Wales, that has nothing to do with anything except that he knew Tommy from years before. With a conspiracy, it's an unlawful agreement, isn't it? If you and I, I say, sure, let's uh, rob the Bank of England. You say, Dave, sounds like a damn fine idea. <laughs> We have then committed the crime of conspiracy and unlawful agreement. So, and you've got a much better chance of getting a conviction if you're a prosecutor because you can throw in all sorts of vague stuff. Um, we went to trial. Uh, just before the trial, several things happened to make it worse. Um, because there were no drugs, they handed out indemnities to all the couriers. Why did the couriers uh, so happily change from knowing nothing to I'll testify against him? Because something very bad happened that they were told was the beginning of 
kill all witnesses. It wasn't anything of the kind, but uh, part of their policy, when they arrested four or five of us, that didn't work. They arrested everybody else they could find, family members. My mother was dragged in. Oh, dear. Uh, she, she wasn't locked up, uh, but um, they, whatever jewelry she, she had, they said, oh, that's all stolen. She was released. They came and said, we've got everybody and we've got your wives. That's Michael's wife. Uh, Marie and mine, Clelia. This made a bit of a wrinkle to it. Whereas you can sit back and say, you know, go for it, boys. I'll just put my feet up and catch up on my reading in prison. Uh, see what you can do. A bit different when they're holding people over you. I said, look. Uh, well, I said nothing. I said, we'll see if they get bail. If the girls get bail, then there's nothing on them. Uh, the the two girls were in the couldn't get bail. They were in the women's prison. One night I was in my cell uh, in the men's prison, of course, and they had no TVs. It was a radio broadcast. Uh, they had the eleven o'clock news at night. Last story: there was a fire at the women's prison. Three fatalities. So after less than easy night's rest, after all, there's only what hundred and something women in the whole prison. Uh, Michael and I charge out, look at each other, head for the main desk. Uh, one of the officers we half knew, what's the story? Uh, Dave, uh, we're just, um, I've got all the information in. Look, uh, can't say. What well, you can't say is all right or it's not all right. Uh, look, uh, yeah. I'll make a couple of calls. I said to Michael, this is, uh, uh, this is awful uh, because um, I haven't heard of anybody taken in for treatment. I've heard fatalities. So none of the screws had look at us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying they were all bubbling over with sympathy, you know, uh, but they didn't like dope dealers and particularly uh, people involved in heroin. So, uh, but when you get the next call, which is, uh, oh, you've got, got, a, got a visit, uh, go for it. Wandering up there by ourselves, turn the corner and the whole family are there behind the, the screen. That was it. <laughs> and uh, Whose whole family is that? All of my family in, in, in Michael's side, all of his family and the Colombian family, they're all there. And... Uh, you know, I was saying, but alive, no. <clears throat> so um, conversations which have been kind of glib and light with my lawyer, who was a big uh, hippie defense lawyer, got people off a, a cannabis charge that was the wrong kind. Pretty flexible guy, you can imagine. Uh, the conversations would go like this. He'd come in and say, well, I've, we've got this material from the courts. Rainer, there's a telephone number. Call this man. I want guns and I want him at the court next time I'm there. <laughs> I just wanted to go insane. Uh, they, uh, and this wasn't like instantaneously. This was, was for quite a while because they, they kept, tripping over. They'd gone to the, the couriers and said the girls were killed. It wasn't that. There was one of them. Um, they, they put a little half-wit arsonist informer in, uh, in their dormitory and she started a fire and uh, it was all wood, the whole dormitory covered in steel. And So she was mentally ill, this woman, the arsonist? Yes. Yeah, she was a little... And the police her. had put her in with your girlfriend yeah, to and with the, you, she was sold with the Colombian lady as well. Mm. And then she wasn't getting the information and she just went nuts and started a fire. Not entirely nuts. The fire was, as I understood it, um, to uh, get them moved somewhere else, to bring them closer together, to have something in common, a little protest. It wasn't run around and torch the place, but... It was designed to break I mean, down look at where we are. We're in a confined space. Yeah. I don't think um, 
getting 12 boxes of matches and, and everything you could and burning on the carpet would be a good idea. Uh, it's always an embarrassment for governments when um, they kill their inmates. Um, doesn't look good. But uh, one by one, the, the couriers all took the offer, a complete indemnity, and including the introduction man that I mentioned before, the one who brought Tommy the tie, uh, brought him into our lives. He not only took the indemnity, but took the opportunity when he was in the stand to confess to a bunch of crimes because he could never then be charged for them. When, when the families were there and you saw them, which family man was it told you specifically that your girlfriend had died? Well, my mother was there. She was in tears already. Uh, Clelia's brother, Mario, was there. Uh, uh, and, and he was, um, he was in, in tears and kind of blubbering it out. Did you know just seeing the tears then? Oh, as soon as, as soon as we turned the corner and I looked down one way and saw all of them not right, a bunch of people not right. Down the other room, Michael's people not right. Uh, you know, some of the family had flown from Colombia. I, I looked at him briefly, but uh, I just wanted to to know. And then when I got close enough, there, there wasn't. I, I listened. I participated. You're in shock. I. Uh, I was crying. You know, in that part of yourself, when something very bad happens, is off on its own thing. There's the somewhere in there is a rational person, but you're almost a witness to this other one behaving strangely in in, in, in tears and a kind of empty rage. If something happens to somebody that you're close to, or, or something that's really wrong, you can feel anger. And, and, and a call to action. But this is different when something's taken away from you. Something so eviscerating and emptying is that. There's nothing there. As well as that anger and call to action, or was there an impotence of being incarcerated? You oh, couldn't... completely. And guilt. Let's not forget guilt. Whatever the circumstances, uh, she'd been struck by lightning. Something about my life had, had brought this upon her. I mean, you know, she, she was a tearaway. Things could have happened. But it's not the point. Something about my life did this. And was her, the attitude of her family that you were responsible, or were they just heartbroken? And um, I expected that her family would uh, feel I was respon uh, responsible, but they didn't. The old man who had the restaurants, he went out of his way to send me a message that, no, everything's OK. okay. Up, to, up until the police sent his double-dealing lawyer to go and tell him that David had something to do with it. So the police so, are now going to uh, use this sure. to their advantage. <clears throat> yeah, you might say, well, that just sounds petty. Why would they do that? Because it's another bunch of people with support and influence. Um, there's a trial coming up. There's no drugs. We have to win this trial. To make it worse again, of course, um, because they'd pumped this story up, Michael and I were whisked away from the um, the number plate factory. Well, you're a James Bond supervillain, now, aren't you? You are able to have people set on fire in other yeah, prisons. I know. Yeah, I know. Um, but what happened next didn't help that uh, um, any. While um, we eventually got out of the, uh, as the trial was approaching, we got out of the supermax. Uh, it. Uh, and, and back into the regular part of the prison, working in the number plate factory. And a big press is there. They used to call them the never get out machine because of the noise that they made. What was the difference between the Supermax and the general <clears throat> oh, population? Huge, but I'll be back there in a minute, okay. so I can tell you then. <laughs> uh, I'm in number plates, and we've got a little scheme going to, to escape. Um, but it's not, the scheme that we really had, which was uh, the old fashioned way over the wall, was interrupted by uh, my friend and accountant coming to me and saying, your old mate, Tony Moynihan from uh, the Philippines has been in touch. Lord, Lord Moynihan. Tony Moynihan. He's sending somebody to get you out of prison. 
And what was your relationship with Moyna and for this? I went to him in 79 trying to get a container loads of uh, tie sticks uh, uh, transshipped through um, the Philippines and onto Europe and back to Australia. Uh, he, <clears throat> I didn't trust him. He turned out to be a con man. He tried to get me to rig the cockfights there. They're big things. 2,000 Chinese guys all betting in a frenzy, you know, millions changing hands. Lord Tony, how can you rig a cockfight? I said, well, you can kill your own bird. You can't make the other one win, that's for sure. <laughs> They're over in seconds. <laughs> so one part of me is saying, yeah, you could get an explosive capsule in the neck of your own bird. <laughs> Bet on the other one. <laughs> But uh, I'm overlooking what somebody told me days later, an old cameraman friend there. He said, he's the biggest swindler in town. And he plays both sides of the fence. <clears throat> so I, I went to him a few days later and I said, Tony, look, I want containers through. I don't want you coming back to me saying, oh, the right bird died. Uh, let's you and I now put a million on it. You've got a million, haven't you? Give me one of your millions and I'll put it right <laughs> on there. I can imagine sitting in this huge, dusty auditorium, you know, with two chickens fighting away like that, <laughs> me leaning on my remote control as some plant in the audience gets something. He's doing something he shouldn't. And more knives <laughs> come out and <laughs> cut me to pieces while Tony makes off with the wager money. Anyway, so was there ill feeling there? I don't know. But he was such a double crosser. He'd been working for the spooks and uh, the police. So when I've got this big case coming up uh, over a, a three year um, conspiracy to, to move drugs around the world, and Tony is sending a guy that's got a helicopter pilot. He's going to fly us out of the prison. Uh, I said to the accountant, no, 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 no. Has he asked for money? Of course. Well, <clears throat> in fact, what had happened was uh, the police had arranged with Moynihan to, for the helicopter escape. The guy was, everybody who was supposedly part of it was an undercover policeman. <clears throat> Three days before the trial starts, they descend upon us drag us back to Sutnamax. We're being kicked by the guards all the way over there, or prison officers, as they insist on, and uh, saying things like, shoot at us from you know, helicopters and from the towers and all that, we're bastards. My God, my God. So we were really stuck for the whole trial in there. Because um, the movie, is the movie just a police perspective then? Because the movie shows you authorizing someone to go back to the house and open all these cans and get all this cash out and pay pay minor and off. Oh, no, they found the canning machine. And yeah. um, they wanted to know where the other cans were. Yeah. They were they were pretty awful about that. I mean, they moved into, it was the early days of confiscations. They moved into our houses, um, partied there for weeks, mm. uh, even caused trouble for local police who only found out that they were this special task force. Mm. You know, shit in the pool, burn the paintings, you know, wreck everything else. Mm. But that's just stuff. It doesn't really mean much. And was it true that you had this nemesis that was the head of that task force that the movie shows? He was young back then. Uh, oh, in the, the Australian police. The Australian police. police before the DEA. Oh, yeah, there was there was a, a, a neighbour and yet somebody else who was very ambitious back there. Uh, the DEA man didn't appear until the the big trial um, in which it, it went for six months. There were 119 witnesses, apart from all these indemnified ones. The jury asked quite early on, you can imagine they're hearing <clears throat> somebody stand up. Yes, uh, I worked as a courier. I made half a million, somebody else. Yeah, I sold the, oh, there was no sellers, but I, I built machines for him. I did this. The jury stopped the trial and asked the judge, um, these are the people, are, are they already sentenced or are they going to trial themselves? And the judge was in in the very awkward position of having to say, well, no, they have taken an agreement that for their testimony, they'll never be charged with anything. It, it really, you could see them all looking at each other, oh, yeah, <laughs> tearing up pieces of paper. So um, you can, in a very long trial, uh, a long trial can be a good trial. If anybody finds him or herself in trial, if if it's a complex one, drag it out because they come to know you. Now, 
he might be a completely loathsome person, in which case they're going to convict. But if they quite like her, well, sure, he's all right. Uh, oh, guilty as hell, but we'll let him go. Um, the the short ones can be too uh, brutal like that. And also the opportunity for the prosecution to make mistakes. Uh, the hippie, by the way, who'd known, who was on trial with us, A, was a good guy because he didn't say anything. Um, and also... Um, because uh, not only did he hold fire, but he was lucky too. His uh, they called his mother in over something very risky thing. I mean, no, nobody likes their mother being called into a court case, and juries are not particularly happy when people's mothers are dragged in. Now, Mrs. Healy, uh, Brenda's mother, the hippie, she was a real mom's apple pie kind of woman, grey hair, white gloves you know, twin set and pearls, baking apple pies, you can bet. And nervous as anything are being dragged in. And all she had to say was something about, yes, there was a car in the driveway. There was a QC running it. His junior couldn't help himself. They don't get much to do, a junior in a court case. Leapt to his feet. Mrs. Healy, uh, your son, he was a lot of dodgy friends that he is. Uh, yeah. And she, she's, well, I can't want to say anything bad about my son, the jury going, what the fuck are you asking him the mother for? Uh, but he, he kept on it, the QC, he's trying to drag him down. Let's just say that the kind of people who might, and, and uh, the jury wouldn't have it, they acquitted him. They came back wow. specially after the trial went out and looked at the prosecution and said, there you are, happy with yourselves? Call somebody's <laughs> mother in? Huh? Do it to me and see what happens. <laughs> um, so uh, that went on and um, uh, the jury went out for a week, called for a picnic. Wanted a, uh, oh, there are no drugs in the trial, so the, the prosecution sent for a sample. Sent for a sample. How'd they do that? Uh, they got a special license to import heroin. Yeah. Flew to Thailand, bought some, brought it back. Uh, must have waved that very interesting piece of paper around at customs when they got back. Just a couple of kilos of heroin, nothing, uh, <laughs> nothing to declare, really. Um, put it on a special stage stand in the courtroom, had a SWAT team operation bringing it in. Oh, and another SWAT team operation with us in chains coming from uh, the jail. Did they give the impression that was your heroin that they'd seized? Oh, they, they, they totally did. The jury thought that. Uh, so um, then um, big sentence uh, in three years in, in the Supermax, which was eventually What was your down. actual sentence? It was 17 years. 17 years? For one count. I was acquitted of 11 out of 12 counts, and then uh, one was enough for this judge. And what percent of your sentence do you have after serving the Australian system at that time? Uh, a little more than half at that time. So you're looking at um, eight? Yeah, yeah. Nine. But I, I had it extra because of the. I was put on trial for the helicopter escape. At the same time. Okay, so the helicopter escape was fabricated by the police. To coincide with the beginning of week one of the heroin trial. So that the newspapers all had it everywhere. In fact, a copy of uh, the equivalent of the, uh, the Sun was put on every juror's um, table with, you know, a $96 million heroin syndicate um, helicopter their way out of prison. They had to use this massive crime boss then. Helicopter escapes. I know, I know. Murdering prisoners yeah. in other prisons. Yeah, this is from a, in actual fact, a third-rate cameraman and a, a junior television executive. I suppose. If people want to watch your movie, it's called "The Man Who Got Away," and where can they find it? It's part of the Underbelly series. The uh, Underbelly series. Yeah, they made a quite a, a bunch of TV movies. Yeah, so um, that was one of them. Um, the, the others are all about different people. So, so that's that. So when that sentence comes down, mm. were you expecting it or did you think you were going to get off? Uh, it was a close call. Um, they had a quite an interesting device. Uh, you could either take the stand and give evidence under oath or give what they call an unsworn statement from the dock. You couldn't be questioned on it, but the judge warns the jury that this is an untestable statement. It's supposed to be something for people who have uh, trouble talking or, or expressing themselves or haven't got a lawyer, they can say, no, I was not at the Rose and Crown on the, night of the 5th 
and I did not hit Gabba going in the nose, <laughs> that kind of thing. But I somewhat misused that, I have to confess. How? I spoke for three days uh, from prepared notes, taking them on a magical journey. Uh, because bear in mind, these uh, our defense was diamond smuggling. And for a little, uh, I wanted um, Tommy to take the ginseng route for the defense. Can be worth a hundred thousand for the, you know, a bit of ginseng root with a little willy on it and looks like a man. They sell for big money in Hong Kong. <laughs> anyway, he wouldn't go for that. Stuck to gemstones and screwed himself up. The rubies come up under X rays, by the way. It's the aluminium in it that does it. <laughs> um, it sounds like a massive sidetrack, but they disproved his ruby smuggling defense because they X rayed one of the. Um, this is Tommy. Cutlery boxes. Yeah. And no rubies turned up there. He should have taken. He'd be a free man today if he'd taken the ginseng defense. <laughs> We did a lot of things with the jury. Uh, we, we sang to them a cappella. Yeah. Uh, it was a big hit by the nylons back then called I'm Not That Kind of Guy. <laughs> and the judge found out about it, plus lots of other gags, you know. With, mm -hmm. I'm waving a stick around saying, Hello, jury. Watch the stick. You are <laughs> relaxed. We are innocent. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough of this, said the judge when he found out. <laughs> You're not here to entertain the jury. But we were, we were, and everybody is, is on trial. Um, and I, I, I sort of had them with me as I was going through it. Mm -hmm. They were the 13th courier, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, because part of the best couriers were always people who want uh, an exciting life rather not do a bag load of jail if it comes to it, but feel they're utterly protected. And that was true to a degree. I mean, I, if, if somebody got arrested, I would always either buy them out or I would say, look, here's your options. Do it in pretty good comfort, you know, cable TV, lots of food, uh, reduce sentence. I say the word and you're out next week the hard way. Wall comes down. Uh, which would have been, don't you think that'd be fun breaking somebody out of prison? <laughs> or is it my little old shorty asshole that he was? But um, you know, getting his way out on a motorbike on a tunnel in Mexico. The pr previous interview before this was to have Johnny Steele, and he broke his brother out and mm. broke him back in. Why did he want to done. get in? Pardon? Oh, he got up to some mischief. He had to go back in. Put him, they put him back in, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Had heard of that kind of thing, so he had a perfect alibi. He um, he was in there innocent for seventeen years, I think, on something he hadn't done. So they made it; they did a protest with the government, mm. um, and ended up getting a lot of media exposure, and ended up getting him freed. But uh, but he had to go back in because he was still technically incarcerated. <laughs> I thought it was one of those things. I was at a um, a country prison once back in the the old days, and guys used to go out of there at night. Um, do an early morning robbery at a bookies and then come back in. <laughs> One screwed it up by seeing, being, you know, calling in at a nightclub and a couple of undercovers of this. Hey, what the hell's he doing here? <laughs> He's locked up, isn't he? Supposed to be. Doing it hard? <laughs> Not very. <laughs> uh, but it, it has been used uh, for a couple of times. So Tommy now, he has screwed up by saying it's the wrong thing, it's the gemstones. Oh, he goes down the gurgler too. He gets 17 uh, years with a minimum of 15, does about 10, well, goes back home. One of the most fascinating stories in your book, just to go on another sidetrack here then, is who Tommy is. Tommy is a nephew uh, of the well, uncle. Well, that's what I didn't know. Can you explain to the viewers who uncle is? Well. And, and, get, and the DEA story, oh yeah. Huh. Yeah, I didn't, couldn't understand why uh, when I went back to Thailand later on, I could understand why the how the Australian police would have been funded for their the undercover things because it was they liked it. It was interesting. Um, then, but what were the DEA involved in it? And what I didn't know about uh, young Tommy was that his uncle was one of the big four, perhaps five 
if you count the white horse bread. Um, well, they, it, it's not so much that they had laboratories. They were the big uh, heroin smugglers uh, of northern Thailand. They don't use laboratories, as you probably know. It's grown, the opium's grown in a village. Laboratory is kind of a, a kitchen outfit that does it independently. A middleman will take the opium to the laboratory, pay them to process it. But the protection of all this is done by the, the bigger people. Are well, they like warlords then? <clears throat> yes. They say you can conduct your business through here. That's fine with me. They they could arrange supply, but they don't need to because that's all. They're semi-political. I mean, uh, Khun Sa was part of the Shan state in northern Burma, wasn't he? Always after for independence. But, and they were funny, whenever one of them had a birthday, they'd send elaborate gifts for each other. Now, Tommy's uncle was one of the big ones there. But why should he be particularly hated by the DEA? Well, for good reason. Um, what I didn't know until I was in enough trouble to realize it, that he was hated, and therefore all of anybody connected with him, because um, a DEA agent stationed in Chiang Mai Though told to sit in a desk and collect your money and do nothing, file some reports, went out into the field, scared a couple of farmers up with their crops, uh, made himself a general nuisance, was warned off. Um, I mean, if you see uh, the village headman one week and be seen talking to him and you're a D agent, when you go back the next month and find that the head of the village headman is sitting on a, a post somewhere, you might blame yourself, but not this guy. He kept at it. So to put the frighteners on him, Uncle arranged that uh, the wife would be grabbed from the street, driven around town, and then released. The DA agent's wife is going to get grabbed. Yeah. Um, actually, I mentioned in new book uh, details in his name for those that are interested in it. Um, but he... Um, the whole thing went wrong. Um, she she and the maid, this is the wife of the DA agent, and the maid are taking the kids to school. They drop them off. Somebody comes in, grabs them. They're put in a van, uh, driven away at speed. No, that part didn't happen because the engine broke down in the van that they were in. They end up surrounded by police. Television crews uh, there are everywhere. Uh, the gunman's... Uh, one's been shot dead by a local policeman and who shot back. Uh, the gunman, to keep himself alive, has taken his revolver, tied copper wire around the trigger of it, and is holding the hammer back with his thumb at the head of the wife, knowing that, well, if you kill me, won't be the only one. So, Uncle hears about this, arranges two things in a hurry. One, uh, to do a swap out, some big kind of uh, Buddhist figure, uh, Buddhist priests, well, they're not really priests, but anyway, um, was going to swap places with the wife so they at least get her out of it. Because uncle's not stupid. He knows that you can't go this far with things. Being scared's one thing, so that you've got the wife in your ear when you get back from work. I just got kidnapped today, you asshole. We're getting out. Um, before anything can be done, uh, the Americans have got onto the biggest Thai connections they've got. The army's surrounding the place, and they're saying, we want him alive. We want to know who's behind this. Um, but it's, it's a hot day. Um, sweat's dribbling down his thumb as he's trying to keep this hammer back. Uh, it was a, a 38, I think, but this is closer to her head. Had to be to be effective, I suppose. Uh, and before the priest arrives, before the deal's done, he turns, it slips, gun goes off, she's dead. Alive, screamed the Americans from down the line. But a more powerful voice, the uncle, calls to the head of the SWAT team, saying the opposite, dead. And he's uh, decapitated by a hide power rifle. That is the gunman in the van. Sorry, no witnesses, nobody to question. But that's never always the end of these things, and uh, the Americans convinced themselves it was Uncle behind it. So several years later, 
um, uh, uncle's driver uh, says it's a flat tire. He'll change it. Well, look at that, says the driver. I'll have a look at that, says uncle. Steps out of the car on the motorway. Peering down at the tire, huge truck barrels over and splatters the uncle. He's out of it. Uh, fortunately for all the workers of the uh, the group, the number two steps straight in, Chinese Thai. Um, a lot of the businessmen in, in Thailand are, are Chinese, but they force them to take Thai names, so you've got to be observant to know. Uh, and justice is done? Well, no. Um, there's something biblical about the DEA. All he and his progeny and those who know him. So everyone connected with the Uncle Tommy all cursed. And um, it was just enough to get Rubbish With Me funded, even though whenever anybody ever asked, well, what's at stake here? A ton? Oh, no. 10 kilos, maybe. Let's talking it out. <laughs> yeah, that's, up, uh, that's up there with the story of Kiki Camarera and the Mexican cartels. Bloody hell. It, well, Michael. those things do happen. There was Cocaine Katie, the uh, Danish girl, who got bigged up into that sort of situation. So um, this, I, it, it wasn't by chance that I kept meeting this DEA guy right throughout. Even in Pakistan, he turned up there. So you're getting a nemesis now in the DEA as well as your nemesis in the Australian task force. Yeah. The only people up until um, uh, much later that didn't care were the British police. In fact, one of them more or less saved me from uh, probable death in, in Pakistan by saying, well, you can't really torture our citizens wow. because there's, uh, they just, well, they don't like, they just personally don't like it. It's very hard to put up with. One of the worst things about the Supermax, for example, there was a little- The Supermax in Australia In Australia, now. Okay. but just as a prison, was listening to somebody else get it. There, there was a little, a women's section there, but you could hear it down these steel and, and metal corridors, the sounds would carry. They had electric doors that would open. And the screws would like to run in at four o'clock in the morning and beat you up and all that. And the guys kind of got used to it. But there was a little girl there. Well, little. She was 20. She was drunk off the streets half the time. But she used to play up a bit, you know, bang and crash things around. And one night there, some of the, 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 the bruises went in and, uh, and chained her up to the toilet and gave her a pounding. Do they use sticks or anything? No, they just kicked her all over the place. But these were huge guys. Yeah. And I, I said to some of um, uh, the wingmates the next day, I said, I don't know about you, but that was worse listening to that than uh, them coming in to get me. He said, it's true, though. Even if the guy next door to you, you feel yeah. really bad. If they came on, come in on you, they well, you know they're not going to kill you. Yeah. But um, so those things, but um, you know, we are civilized more or less in the West, whatever anybody thinks, and, and generally don't go too far. But in Pakistan, they, they don't really believe in any such thing. You know, if anybody's ever had a question that they've asked themselves, which has a possibly horrible answer, like perhaps a young Sean asked himself, I wonder how I'd handle a bit of jail, or what if I was a room full of guys who kill me. And I think I asked myself when I was at some age, how would I cope with being tortured? I don't think I'd like it. <laughs> well, yes, but you don't really know why until it happens. Um, this is a good teaser for the, the, the Pakistan stuff. Um, mm. but, but let's go back to you, get, you just got sentenced. Mm. Well, yeah, and the first uh, um, and there was appeals, it all came to nothing. Uh, with the helicopter escape and everything else, uh, it was pretty hard to move. But in fact, there was an escape that, um, just to keep my hand in, I was involved in in the Supermax. So you're now, you've been sentenced, you're in Supermax, and now you're doing a genuine escape. You're planning yeah. a genuine escape. Yes, okay. um, but I don't want to go with them. Oh, the government made a plan this. 
Oh, yeah. No, there were six of them in them. Okay. Uh, one friend of mine and, and three others. Two of them are murderers I don't much like because they're the kind of people you'd have to uh, get rid of before they got rid of you if you went over the wall with them. Um, one guy was okay, but a blabbermouth. Two were, uh, and another one was a complete dickhead. So he would do what he later did when we got him out, which was ring up his girlfriend straight away. Uh, he should just run police headquarters. It would have been saved a phone call. So, um, but nonetheless, an escape is always worth uh, having a, a bit of a hand in. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and this was quite a challenge because the Supermax was within another prison within, and it was all steel, electronic, cameraed up. Uh, you couldn't open two doors at a time. Exercise yard had a steel mesh over it. In short, uh, we'd arranged it to distract the guards on, they were in a locked in control board system, to distract them with nonsense about, you had to be let out to have a shower and sign for a razor blade. And all that. Uh, while the other guys pretended to play cards, a card game with the cameras on one side, there was a blind spot. Broom handles and mop handles for their heads as they dripped away one by one. In the corridor, making sure that the doors are opening, is clever Trevor the artist, who's using paints that smell a bit. Did you open? No, I don't want to go out the yard at night, but just the outside vent to let the fumes out. <laughs> then, oh, could you close that one? Because I, I need to go and get a cup of tea. The, the guard on duty that night, he was on his control panel. He said, oh, look at that. I'm lit up like a Christmas tree tonight. I thought, you wait till tomorrow, you'll be lit up then, right? <laughs> so slowly they've all got into the end. Um, and in the way that escapes go, the guys cut through to the top of the roof of the supermax, then came back in. And uh, one of them who was like a triple murderer, had every reason to leave, uh, said, uh, uh, Dave, uh, looking good, we go tomorrow night. I said, Robert, you go tonight. You're not coming back in. If you don't go tonight, this won't hold. It just won't. Uh, and it's true, even from the escape in Thailand, if I'd have left it another night, as people asked, well, um, you don't survive that one. So there was a little suspicion over that, but eventually they let me through. I ended up towards the end of the sentence at a, um, a ridiculous country house prison where I'm running a cafe there. And that's uh, eight, nine seven, years uh, later. Yeah. Uh, Can you just describe a bit what Australian Supermax prison was like back then? This was closed. It was called Jika Jika. Uh, during, um, they had to move everybody out of there. Uh, it held 48. The death toll every year was about 20. Uh, oh. People would kill each other in there the first chance they got. Somebody I knew had a, the units only had six people in them, but it was very intense. There's nothing to do. Uh, you have to sign for toilet paper just about. Uh, the food's all shit and it's sitting in the corridors for hours before you get it. You can't do anything. What was an average meal? What was it? Uh, last year's lamb chops sitting on a window. I don't know. It was just, you know, Australian prison food is not terrific in the first place. Yeah. But we had our little rackets. Yeah. I mean, the, the, well, we used to dry out bread and rub the two pieces together and you make a kind of flour. <laughs> and they, they let you buy a sort of sandwich maker so you could mix that with milk and an egg and make a kind of right. air sets pancake or something. But um, the screws had all gone natty too. They were all in ready. One of them uh, filled his gun full of... Uh, or loaded up his gun, ran into the staff room and shot every one of them. Luckily, it was blanks. They didn't want to work with him anymore. There were protests, suicides, which are not easy to do in a room that's been purpose-built with steel, everything. The bed was concrete, a solid block. Uh, and then that big escape from there. How did they kill themselves then? Uh, what you've got to do it is um, um, tear up your sheets so that you get strangled by the electronic door when it's opened. I mean, it's determined, isn't Good it? grief. Or you've got to, um, you can kind of, uh, if you can get something to wedge between uh, the narrowest part of the doorway, 
you can push yourself off the sink, provided you're, you tie your hands and legs behind you. Wow. But again, that's determination. You know, we've all felt miserable and think, okay, I'll press the X button and I don't exist. But there's a different story when you've got to dangle there for a while and slowly choke to death. You mentioned the hands. prisoners killing each other. So in America, Supermax, you're in a cell, you can't get out. Did these guys have access to a day room where they were co-mingling to kill each other? Uh, yes, but um, they tried and failed to try and get a mix uh, that would get along. Um, one that one particularly grisly one was with uh, Barry, who was fighting with another murderer. Murderers are very competitive. And one had killed a few more than the other. Well, the hierarchical, yeah. yeah. We've got unfinished business here. You've you know? murdered a kid, and I've murdered a gangster. I'm going to kill you for murdering a kid. That's not. That's against the rules in America. This place, yes. Well, it's pretty much against the rules anywhere. But this place was so crazy uh, that the people, I mean, they put quite mad people in there as well. Um, were you uh, assaulted or did you get any situations in the supermarket? I had to control people very carefully. Uh, some people I could see were, uh, I mean, a couple of people had befriended me and said, oh, do you mind if I kill Michael? Yeah, yeah. I've got a card game going later on. You know, he's, I'm thinking, right, you know, okay, what do I deal with that one? And what methods did you use to control them? Um, hope in hopeless situations, I'd give them the idea that you know, uh, we'd all get out one day and um, we'd meet up and make a night of it. We would, but the end of the night would involve a couple of bags of lime and a shovel on my part. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> they were so bad, you just wouldn't want to let them on the loose. You know, the kind of people, if you saw them in your neighborhood, come in, they're going to see you. <laughs> cameras around here. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely meet later. Uh, the tri you mentioned the triple murderer was on the escape. Do you know who he'd murdered? Yeah, he was a bastard anyway. He deserved to die a thousand times over. He killed... Not anybody could fight back. One uh, weakling and some girl that he'd stabbed oh, to death yeah. like a hundred times or something. Oh, no. And had the nerve to bounce around the prison like he was a, you know, a man or something. Yeah. People who were not like that, like from my old uh, safe-cracking uh, friends from there, when they got the opportunity, they'd finish them off. But they weren't going to do another life sentence on their crappy behalf. Yeah. Um, and a lot of, you know, so many of those guys uh, that were you know, really good, you know, the, the kind of people you can, you don't have any contact with, you're in some weird place and you finally get through that phone call and you start to explain it. And the guy says, he's, he's packing something at three in the morning. Sean, don't tell, uh, tell me anything. Just what have I got to bring? How much and, and when, <laughs> you know? Um, very hard, and I'd always hang on to those sort of people. But that is the understanding. You've got to be there for them as as they are for you. And and it's very reassuring. And in Thailand, I had that. I had I had friends. And I was surrounded by people, you know, schmuck couriers who'd been just used cheaply and then abandoned. Others who just wandered into something. One guy was in there in Thailand, they, they had to send him back out to get arrested because he'd been ratted out to the police, but the police missed the call. So they said, what are you doing? I mean, how? Oh, welcome back. Uh, no, we've got another job for you tomorrow. And they sent him back to get him arrested as part of the deal. <laughs> So, so Michael, anyway. is, is Michael fearing for his life in Supermax in Australia? Is, is Tommy in there with you? Is he? Are you guys protecting each other? Are you agree? They were both. Tommy was an albatross around my neck. Really? Uh, having to try and steer him into a sensible trial. Um, and then um, Michael was a bit, I mean, he was an art teacher. He He wasn't, I once tried to give him a bit of jail slang so he'd know the words. Uh, or explain what they were. Back in those days, a Zach, which was six months, meant six months. Uh, it really goes back to the British Navy a thousand years ago or something. <laughs> anyway, um, and he'd poo poo be back there. I'd say, but don't explain all that to me. I'll never need to know that. <laughs> the day we were arrested and arrived at the prison, we were in the shower rooms and people are getting shoved all over the place. And for me, 
uh, the, the sort of trashy, the, the, um, the, they call them billets there, they call it something else here. Anyway, somebody was bringing us a cup of tea in, in, in China cups, as all the rest were fighting it over. The tea, my God, yes. I said, now that we're here, would you care to know the rest of those slang words or will you just pick them up as you go along, will you? <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of changed his view about, you know, being a pompous twit, but um, he, it would still come out from time to time and he didn't take it well. I mean, our wife's death was uh, just yeah, very hard to take, but I was younger, I guess I, I re recovered better. Uh, How long were you in shock for? Um, three months when I was non-functional, then I sort of came round to it. During that time, did you think about killing yourself? Um, yes, but not as seriously as I did later on. Okay. Um, because I'm talking about this quite lightly now, mm -hmm. but a lifetime of this, where you're going up and then brought down into the utter depths of hopelessness, mm -hmm. it takes its toll. Um, uh, my partner Jeanette tells me my sleep is something to behold. It's not normal. Mm -hmm. uh, and the dreams are not. They're extraordinary. Every night it's a new prison. The art director deserves an Oscar, really, because the design of them's different. Some are spacey and modern. Some you don't know are prisons. That's the cute thing. <laughs> You only get to the top of the city and feel the solid glass, the dome, to realize that this is no city, this is the prison. Um, and part of the way you deal with this, you cleave off part of your character uh, and you put that to one side. But I think it's had its effect. I mean, all people do this, but I suppose you've had dreams where You've been surprised by something that happens in the dream? Yeah. I think about that. Part of your brain is planning a surprise for the conscious part. Who is this guy who's doing that? But I, I meet all sorts of characters who reveal themselves to be something else later on, uh, and you can tell. But so the, 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 the prison's there all the time. Um, so there's ups and downs of taking its toll. But I sort of came around after clearly his death, but Michael was 36. He never really got over it. There were times in that supermax he just wanted to be dead. Wasn't she pregnant, his wife, as well? Yeah. Um, Did she have the baby? She yeah. just had the baby. So the baby survived the fire. Baby survived, little Sean, and all the worst outcomes there. The Colombian parents uh, offered to take him, which would have been the perfect answer. New world, new life, grown up with... Uh, influence and money and and lots of aunties to love him. Um, but a little selfishly, Michael wouldn't sign the release on that one. Mm. Why? He told me because he wanted to, he'd never be able to see him and all of that. I said, so, oh, well, it's about him or you. Mm. Uh, and uh, his, his own mum had taken the baby on and that it'd be hard for and I still couldn't get it mm. um, and so he grew up a mess mm. but uh, that, that's that, that's always the curse of these that's just something else to feel guilty about really mm. um, as you know uh, the drug world is the most peculiar crime amongst all crimes can we imagine the day comes when Oh, yeah, you can murder people tomorrow. Oh, you can rob people in houses. And yet a drug will be legalized. So what was the mistake in the first place? What was, why the life sentences? Why the death sentences? Don't you think that'll force the price up? Don't you think that'll bring in people who are a little bit nastier than uh, the gentle folk in the hills who are growing a bit of weed? Uh, if you... Uh, make heroin illegal. Don't you think they'll get it somewhere where it ain't so good? Um, uh, I don't know. It, it, it is so mad at, at my age. I just I can't understand it except a total weakness. Well, I agree. Part you've got, of uh, um, political 
well, drug laws have created the drug problem. Pablo could get a kilo of coca paste for sixty dollars, mm. and it was going for sixty thousand a kilo on this kilo of cocaine in America. So they made worthless plants worth more than gold. The drug laws doesn't matter what it is. Let's imagine, Sean. Tomorrow, peanuts are outlawed. <laughs> No reason for it, something or other. I mean, there was Gallic War years ago, but it's another story. Um, and a whole generation goes past. You're saying to your son, who's dabbling in, uh, well, they're just peanuts, you're not under the walnuts. No, um, not the hard stuff, not the Brazils, don't even talk about them. <laughs> and you say to your son, look, I understand we, there's no sensible thing behind that law, but Look at those nut dealers and their big cars and gold chains. And there was a killing last week. Somebody choked to death, and that was because of bad nuts. <laughs> and somebody, some little lone voice back there and said, well, what's it illegal for anyway? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a, you know, a legalizer, obvious troublemaker. I round him up for the next <laughs> lot. Um, even otherwise sensible people would feel they hear peanut dealer. And they go, whoa, uh, who is he? Um, as it doesn't matter what it is, because in just think in 500 years, it'll all be meaningless. As uh, entertainments, uh, drug wise, uh, we'll do on our equivalent of our phones, as we'll be able to uh, program in the uh, uh, adrenaline or uh, insulin, uh, because all of them are just triggering electrical effects. Um, we we're, were programming a good time, but you know too, don't you? That if 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 we if we make this pill, it doesn't have any harmful effects. You can stop taking it after ten years, and you don't even get a moment's withdrawal. Just feel damn fine. It's illegal, isn't it? In fact, I've gone the extra mile now in the UK and made that so. Everything that affects the brain is now illegal, except for nominated things such as caffeine and tobacco Unless and alcohol. you're a corporate entity who's profiting from everything yes. else. Yeah. And as, as I think we were talking about the other day, it's very hard to make a way of legalizing the other drugs and taxing them at the proper rate because you'll never wrest control of the black market that's already there. You'd have to undercut that black market with quality or, or supply or something. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be a while, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely. So how long were you in the Supermax for then before you go okay. down the security level? Um, about three years. And the thing that closed it down, there was a protest there by six of the guys in one wing. The plan was sit fire to the mattresses. Uh, the stink would go through the air conditioning system, the black smoke, and the guards would feel threatened and they'd listen to us. So there was a riot. Well, it was not so much a riot as a, a organized protest. Uh, this facility, the Supermax, held about 50 prisoners. It took uh, more than that many uh, guards to run it. Six of them in uh, the one section, in a row of cells, decided that they'd make their displeasure known um, by setting fire to their uh, foam mattresses, mm -hmm. which uh, let off a kind of well, it did smoke when anybody had done that. Now, the whole place was utterly sealed from the outside world with two-inch thick bullet-resistant glass. Uh, uh, so the, the windows never opened and it was reliant on the air conditioning system to keep air moving. So their plan was get a bit of smoke into the guard's room and they'll do something about the place. With what happened to your girlfriend, is this concerning you now? Uh, more, more so. Well, I heard about it through uh, Ted, the born again Christian kidnapper of a busload of school children. Oh. So I could believe what Ted told me that it was going to happen and I made sure I wasn't around. Yeah. Uh, and one of them was one of the guys we'd got out and got recaptured. So he was in for a hard time. Anyway, the plan didn't go entirely uh, uh, to as it should have. Um, it was reliant upon them soaking their blankets uh, so they were wet, scooping out the water from the toilet bowl, the steel toilet bowls were built in, which would allow access to the venting 
of the, the toilet system so that if you covered your head in that, uh, you'd be wet and therefore not burnt by flames and you wouldn't have the poisonous air around you to breathe. Now, <coughs> so you can imagine the, the foam mattress is a burning away nicely in a, in a clamped room with electrical pneumatic doors, which will fail when they burn. Um, and they've all got to keep their heads down and hugging the toilet bowl so that not a little bit of air gets in. And as somebody always said in a situation like that, all it takes is one wise guy. <laughs> uh, the one who was nicknamed the ant got a bit nervous about a warm ankle and decided looking at it would help somehow and lifted up his uh, blanket. Uh, at that time, the air was thick with black and green smoke, so heavy it was sinking to the floor. Uh, all the particles of um, toxic rubber uh, in the air. When the ant lifted up his bit of blanket, that smoke sucked straight into all the pipes, ran right along the six rooms, straight into their faces. Of course, their reaction is to not try and close the seal and breathe their way through it, but panic lifted it all out. And the protest was very effective and the place was closed because those six guys were charred remains by the end of the day. Oh, shit. And no guard would work in the place. So, um, wow. job done. <laughs> um, uh, but I've always thought it's a bit like those kind of crazy things, a, a bit like holding a gun to your own head and saying, one move and I'll shoot me. Yeah. They're, they're not going to work out well. So I got moved to uh, the larger prison, ended up working in the prison bakery, got all sorts of interesting things going there. I don't mean particularly criminal, but just jail survival stuff. We had the guy in the forklift truck. He would take the, the food out. I had the butcher take out the fillet steaks from the, uh, the beef. Um, somebody else would... Uh, I supplied speed to uh, uh, my boss in there, uh, and <laughs> the, the, they wouldn't let the security department wouldn't let me have some fancy TV one. So I had to get my my boss from the bakery to come with me to get it out of the security office. <laughs> and one of the sarcastic uh, chiefs of security turned to me as my as he says he's got three stripes. He's a chief, my boss. He's struggling out the door with this TV. <laughs> Yeah, you can have your TV now, David. Tell your boy to take it to your room. Don't want anybody to see it. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, life wasn't too bad there. And then, uh, you know, I'd learned enough uh, about the place to um, more or less make the best of a bad situation. Is that the same for Tommy and David? Have they learned enough to do that? And Michael. They... Um, Michael, they split us up. Tommy went um, somewhere else. Michael went to another place because I'm a bit behind them. Yeah. Remember, I've got another 18 months for the great helicopter escape that wasn't, um, <laughs> which you know has followed me all around for many, many years. Yeah. Um, but it was just as well the ties never heard that story. So, not that they would have given it to us. So, Tommy and Michael are getting up before uh, you. Yeah. They're not uh, struggling. I'm at, this is where I found things never end. Uh, you might think looking at this constant arcing of uh, getting into obvious danger and then just narrowly getting out of it is something that I, I'd want to avoid. But kind of picture this. I've done 10 years. I've had to keep on my toes. Okay, I'm at a, a country prison. I'm running a little cafe there. Uh, everybody's insane in this house. Uh, the governor, it comes to the point where one of the women that drive me into town to get supplies for the cafe, she's run off to the hairdresser. She's a prison officer. And the governor's on the radio telling me, David, you bring that woman back here. Or, well, Tell her she's never allowed to go out without you again. <laughs> yeah, that'll get her. Have so, you got your own cell as well? 
Yeah, I've got a little room. It's like a, a unit. It's got a shower and uh You can all shower in your room. Oh yeah, yeah. It's got an ensuite and oh, uh, sweet. <laughs> uh, I've got everything. Because I'm running the cafe, I've gone yeah. to the my friend who runs the kitchen. I said, Look, I'm not buying anything in town except what you guys want. So I've got a long shopping lift with uh Kalmata olives, you know, uh, cream cheeses, stuff like that. All the stuff for the cafe. The kitchen guys steal from the kitchen supplies and give to me. Yeah. Um, and so, I, as they always say, the only person who makes uh, any money out of the staff canteen is the uh, uh, the prisoner who runs it. Um, I've caught the prisoners, uh, sorry, the staff so often stealing things from the place. I'm pretty much, uh, I used to work late because of the canteen. I was taking a shower in the main building one night. And on my way in there, there's big plastic bags full of eight, ten tins of beans and peas and all this other stuff, clearly from the kitchen, slightly miffed that they're stealing things I'm having stolen. And I get out of the shower, flick the lights off in my dressing gown, waiting, and a uniformed hand comes down to grab <laughs> these bags. <laughs> Hi there, senior. What, uh, what brings you here? I'm a stroll. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dave, fuck, I thought it was one of those cars. <laughs> what, he, what he was upset was he thought it might have been one of his fellow staff members, but it was only me, so he wasn't worried. <laughs> but it made a slightly uncomfortable relationship because every time I'd come back from my numerous home leaves, I'd have one every weekend, I'd lug a huge bag of things <laughs> back and he'd see me at the gate and run over to do the check <laughs> because he didn't want me getting arrested uh, or, quote, dragging something back because maybe I'd be stupid enough to tell his story. Yeah. But they were all like that. So there's about five of them running towards the gate to make sure that I don't get into trouble. I was told early on, if you can control the food, you can control the prisoners. That's the place to be. But um, the slightly not so good part comes in now. Just as I was getting towards the end, a couple of uh, policemen from the old task force come to visit mm. me on some pretext mm. uh, saying, uh, oh, here's for your old spy equipment back. You can have it. Yeah, it's 10 years out of date. Mm. They come to visit you at the prison yeah. to give you spy equipment back. From 10 years confiscation. To back. give it you in the prison. Yeah, equipment. yeah, yeah. And they leave it in my property. I said, what do you really want? Uh, nothing, you know. We were just talking about the good old days. Oh, yeah, yeah. load of laughs for me. Huh? Um, I see you're all senior officers now, done well off the back of that. You know? um, and they kind of went away, but I, next home leave, I noticed they were hanging about. Undercovers were back on my case. When I finally got released, the stuff that I sent back home, like some carvings and some woodwork things from over the years, were all cut to pieces. Mm. And I, I got the van driver and I said, who did it? And he, he wouldn't say, he'd been scared. They think you got drugs in this stuff? No. Or is it just They're just goading me, saying, we're, you're back, but we're watching. Uh, they'd leave obscene messages on my uh, answer phone in, in the flat. So I kind of stripped down, went Spartan, very simple living, not too much. Found their bugs and things. They'd come a long way in years before. Before it was simple transmitters. Now it was spread spectrum transmissions, the kind of stuff they use now. Picks a little bit of one channel and keeps jumping around them so you can't pick them up. Are you behaving yourself on your home leaves? Are you yeah. committing crimes? Uh, no, no, I'm, I've got some money. Um, some people are very late paying me. Suddenly decided weeks before my release that it'd be a good time to do it. Um, but I'm not rich or anything. I'm just okay. But um, because they, I, I met a girl, I was going out with her, they started to get to her, don't you know, have anything to do with him, he'll turn you into a courier. I mean, it wasn't the right type anyway. Um, but I, I felt hounded in, so I, I surfed that out. I, I knew they'd run out of money eventually, but then I found another load. These were federal police this time. So I thought, to hell with it. I'll leave the country, uh, even though I was on parole. And But how do I do that? Times have changed. Not so easy to get false passports. When I say false, they, they can't be just looking like a passport. It has to be on the computer or it won't work. 
So if you jump parole, aren't you going to be a fugitive again now? But you're at the nearest. Yeah, but it's very hard to get sense. it if you've been released. Um, virtually impossible to get sent back to another country for a parole breach. They've released you, and they don't like that anymore. But that's not the crime. All extraditions are. What did he do? They can't start talking about the old crime because you know Sean's already served it. Like if you if you left the U.S. early from, though I think they deported you anyway, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. But if you'd somehow managed to get a, a local day release there and then you fled, um, they'd have trouble in an extradition court. Okay. Because you'll always say, wait a minute, they released this man. Yeah, but he breached the conditions. That's an internal matter. That's mm, okay. not something to. Um, so I was going to go. I went to a lot of trouble to um, get a clean passport and to be undetected. I stopped in Thailand on the way over to Europe. Um, to um, uh, pick up some money there um, and then met Tommy. Now, at this stage, I didn't know about the uncle, uh, the DEA, the dead wife in a van you know, that they tried to put the frighteners on. I didn't know that uh, Tommy was completely hated. Uh, and I also let him know where I was actually staying at the Oriental Hotel. Mm. and. When we first started talking, I mentioned that I took the trouble to make a tape recording because I knew I was being followed and, and the calls were being intercepted back in Melbourne, a tape recording saying, making it clear I was in Melbourne. So when the Americans picked me up off the back of Tommy coming down from Chiang Mai, uh, an argument then broke out with the Australians. Well, we've got him here. He's under surveillance. Uh, no, he's not. Then. It effectively, I, I couldn't get out of the country. Um, I got to the airport. This was a really hard to take part. Uh, saw all around, as soon as I got to check in, I knew something wasn't right. I could see people in the balcony. I could see people not looking at me. You should have been looking at me. That's as bad as the other way around. Um, the check-in girl, referred to something on the desk and said, ah, I've just got to do some checks on this passport. <laughs> you know, me too. Um, so uh, I meant, instead of going through the exit of the um, airport, this is what you do. You go to um, where people are being dropped off, arrivals, and jump into a taxi that should join the rank and wait his turn, but it'll take a cash job straight away so they can drive straight out. So I lost them there. Uh, took two tuk tuks, walked by foot, went through a supermarket, uh, got to uh, a place to make some phone calls. I was kind of stressed by this stage because I've served 10 years. They're waiting for me when I get out. I couldn't even go to the gravesite of where Clelia was mm. because I picked up a couple of spooks behind me. And something said, I don't want to be standing in front of her grave, which I feel guilty about anyway without having some supervisory nitwit behind me mm. taking notes about it all. I mean, that is not a moment of closure. So um, I think I've made it. You know, I've been in the air. I've had that sense of freedom and the seatbelt sign goes off and I'm looking at my passport and I've got a backup one. It's a New Zealand one. It's perfectly clean. Uh, and yet, Within a week, I'm being chased through Bangkok streets by all my old enemies, uh, you know, for no reason that I could even figure out. Uh, so you've not gone back to the business? No, not at that stage. Okay. No. Uh, it was only uh, when they arrested me on the passports and some 50 grand I had, that disappeared quickly enough, um, and then said, Oh, by the way, at the airport, there's uh, 300 grams. Uh, well, I think that came from somebody I knew who was running through there with a bit of well, effectively personal at that level. But that was enough. Uh, uh, a link to that was enough to get me the death penalty in Thailand. They put that th someone else's 300 grams on you because oh, of yeah, your reputation yeah. Yeah. Oh, to get yeah. you the death penalty in Thailand. I, I knew I would never win Holy the case. Shit. If they'd have... If they had more time or, or, or check with the guy who sweeps the floor, yeah. they would have got probably a bag load that they always do every day from people who get to check in and go, oh, fuck it, I'm not taking that with me. Okay, on this note then, I think we better close up here. We've done 
David's Australia story. He's been in prison in Thailand. He's been in prison in, was it India? Um, not India, that's yet to come, but uh, <laughs> no, it won't be coming. What was the other country? Um, uh, Pakistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Afghanistan. Uh, and some pretty close calls in South America. Oh my God. So we've only done, I can't believe this, we've only done Australia on this first podcast. He's going to be up for the death penalty now and he's going to escape from the Thai prison. So we have to do the full Thai prison story if David is so kind as, as to come out of his time and come back here and, and do more of us. You know, that yeah, in part will like to, yes, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. in, in, in part, that will depend upon, you know, how you feel about the story today. If you can please post in the comments whether you like a continuation of this, how you felt hearing the story so far. And also, if we do a second part, if you put your questions in the comments section, I will ask David some of those questions when he comes back for part two, if he's, if he's up for that. And, so. and, and any advice that people might need, you know? Yeah, I mean? any advice. <laughs> I'm staying out of trouble. Of course. <laughs> you could do worse than get locked up in an Amsterdam prison right now. <laughs>